Bible says when we die, we shall encounter the God we love directly, face to face, that is what The light or the fire of his love, which burns for us, will have no painful effect for those who are in need of purification. It will light up our egotistical lives as they have never been revealed to us before. What we glimpsed only partially. say, first of all, that I'm not a Newman scholar, um, um, and I don't have really Newman. I don't, I mean, you, many of you have more knowledge of writings of Newman than I do. So, over my life, Newman's writings have been um, very, very important for me in helping my journey. First of all, the journey that I made Um, and I picked up his essay on the development of doctrine, and that was the kind of dramatic thing that took me out of the evangelical world. And um, and also his patristic writings. Um, but it was his apologia pro vita sua that um, was so important in my journey to the Catholic faith. Um, and I, I was. some of these uh, last days of Newman's Anglican life. 
quote from one of the high officials of the Dark Castle, so the Dark Castle. They have a real objective to all of us, and we need to do all that we can to welcome them, to help them, and continue to honor that call to serve the Lord now that they are an established church. So that's um, where I'm uh, spending most of my time now. Way back when. My ordination to the Anglican priesthood happened at Christ Church of Cathedral Oxford in 1980, and I remember going to not a Christian, but to the Gascal Taylor in London um, to get myself fitted for a cassock, my first cassock. And he was so funny that guy. He said, "How many buttons do you want on it? If you're..." One of those Anglo Catholic guys, you might want to get away with a few less. <laughs> so I almost put on my cassock today, tonight. I know that um, my Roman Catholic has 30 buttons, so that seems to be pretty much where Roman belongs out the kids. The Church of England clergy. This had been somewhat revised in 1865, so it was not as nearly as severe as what the Tractarians had to deal with in the 1930s and 19, or 1830s and 1840s. And here was the ascent that had to be made. I ascent to the 39 Articles and to the Book of Common Prayer and the ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons. I believe the doctrine of Church of England, as therein set forth, to be agreeable to the Word of God. And every Anglican priest, every Anglican deacon, every Anglican bishop in the Church of England, from the beginning, had had to learn this. Um, I was excused from making this declaration of assent because I was ordained by letters to my history from and in the Episcopal Church, because the Episcopal Church um, was very much influenced by the Tractarians. Um, there was never a vow, uh, an oath that had to be made to the 39 Articles. They were printed in the prayer book at the back, but they were called basically a historical document. But in England, it still is required. Now, when John Henry Newman anonymously published Tract 90 on February 27th in 1841, the, the tract actually was dated January 25th on the conversion of St. Paul. Newman had set out to help the consciences of those who were required to make a formal subscription to the Articles, and especially applies to the clergy and to all the teaching members of the University of Oxford. Newman addressed some of the points in the articles which troubled those who wanted to recover the old Catholic tradition in Anglicanism. The supreme authority of Holy Scripture, even over general councils, Articles 6, 20, and 21. Justification by faith alone that works do not earn grace, Articles 12 and 13. That purgatory, pardons, images, relics, invocations of the saints are contrary to the word of God, Article 22. That transubstantiation overthroweth the nature of the sacrament, Article 28. And that the Bishop of Rome has no jurisdiction So the argument Newman tried to make is that even these more Protestant articles are able to bear a Catholic interpretation. Track 90 opens with the statement of purpose. While our prayer book is acknowledged on all hands to be of Catholic origin, the first edition in 1549, our articles also the offspring of an Elizabeth are 
So the reaction to track 90, especially within the University of Oxford, was hit as vitriolic. Within a month, it had been formally condemned by the abdominal council. Those are the heads of the colleges in Oxford. And the identity of its author had been revealed. Well, the card details these difficult days for Newman, which ultimately led to the resignation of his cure, the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin, in September of 1843. And the next year, he gave up his fellowship to living at Royal College. And he was, for all intents and purposes, shut out of Oxford at that point. And little more. Became his home during those roughly four and a half years of purgatory. Now, Newman knew from the start that his former curate and former student at St. Mary's, a fellow by the name of Charles Golightly, was the <laughs> sole concocter of the whole matter. Now, He was a fierce opponent of the Tractarians, and his methods knew no bounds, and he soon became known as Oxford's spy, because he was always turning in people that harbored Catholic uh, sympathies. Newman's letters are second comes down from the sky, light. My third, he does what he talks, lies. <laughs> and my old is an Oxford spy, no light lies, or no lightly. His relentless campaign to keep Oxford Protestant, according to the standards of the 39 Articles, met opposition within the university from both the growing sectarian movement and also now And the university. And who likely would soon head up the hill to Headington to become the curate of St. Andrews. And when I read this, I did a double take because I was the curate of St. Andrews High School. That was my first encampment after my work placement. It was a crazy little church place. <laughs> <laughs> and then he also was the curate of Headington Quarry, Holy Trinity Headington Quarry. anger and rejection from their former colleagues and friends in the way that Newman did. And as Newman was writing Track 90, it's fascinating to learn of the two controversies from the early church that would shatter the idea, his idea, that the Anglican church can be a via media between Catholicism and Protestantism. Because the heart for a secure Catholic home was his love for the Church Fathers and his desire to be in communion with them and his discovery that Anglicanism might be on the wrong side of the tradition was deeply disturbing and unnerving. And Newman in his letters
One was the Monophysites. Newman saw that the Eastern parties that came into being around the time of the Council of Chalcedon in 451 were comparable to the Biomedia Church of today. And just as Pope Leo's tome was recognizing Just as Leo was able to make that definitive judgment, so the Pope's judgments continue to be decisive. Newman wrote in his Apologia, My stronghold was antiquity. Now here in the middle of the 5th century, found, as it seems to me, Christendom of the 16th and 19th centuries reflected. I saw my face The Church of the Biomedia was in the position of the Oriental Communion. Rome was where she is now, and the Protestants were the Eutychians. These were the extreme monophysites that were especially around Constantinople. Newman saw that the controversial 1841 proposal for a new pan Protestant Jerusalem bishopric was basically in the context of this 5th century ecclesial disorder, trying to put all these groups together in a way that um, you know, did not reflect the centrality of, of, uh, of Catholic life and the Church of Rome. But even more than the monophysites, it was the story about the Donatists. Now the Donatists, um, that, was a, that was a breakaway movement. That was a schism that happened, um, well, its roots were in the third century. But it, it, it just kept hanging on in North Africa. Because the Donatists thought that Catholics were way too, way too worldly, not holy enough. And so basically, they were like an exclusive Protestant denomination. We're, we're, we have the truth. You Catholic folks, you're just all confused. And not only that, we're all It was. explicitly against the tracts for the time. In a nutshell, Wiseman drew on St. Augustine's argument against the Donatists that schism negates the apostolic character of an ecclesial community. Augustine wrote to his old friend from student days in Carthage, the Donatist Bishop Vincent of And he wrote in a way that anticipated the Anglican position Newman saw. It's, it's Augustine's letter 93, which is, I personally think it's one of the most moving letters I've ever read. From Augustine to his schismatical, heretical friend, Vincent, telling him to come home. He said, all the sacraments of the Lord are of the Catholic Church, which you hold and administer as they were held and administered before you left the Church. Now you are with us in baptism, in the creed, in the other sacraments of the Lord, but 
you are not with us in the spirit of unity and the bond of peace or in the Catholic Church. Father Westman brings forth the principle that Newman saw as the foundation of Catholic unity in his answer, or that Augustus saw as the foundation of Catholic unity in his answer to the letter of Parmenius. And here we find those fateful words, Securus unitas formus terrarum. The entire world judges securely. Augustine here is not writing specifically about the primacy of the Roman Church, but more generally about the consensus fidelia that existed throughout the entire Church. Schism is never permissible. Hence the whole world judges with certainty that there are no good persons who cut themselves off from the world, the Church, in any part of the earth. And if Augustine goes on to write this, let us hold it as an irrefutable and proven fact that no good persons can separate themselves from the Catholic Church. That is, that no good persons, even if they are, even if they put up with bad persons who are known to them wherever they live, separate themselves on their account by the rash sacrilege of schism from good persons who live far and far away and are unknown to them. Thus, in whichever part of the world bad things have been done, or are being done, or will be done, there is in other parts of the world that are far away and ignorant of whether these things were done or why they were done, and that nonetheless abide along with the whole world in the bond of unity. <laughs> Future Cardinal Wiseman's article hit Newman so hard was that he himself had helped to author Tract 15 on the apostolic succession in the English church. That was haunting him. Augustine's words kept ringing in his ears. For a mere sentence, the words of St. Augustine struck me with a power which I never felt Securus unitas formus terrarum. By these great words of the ancient father, the theory of the bio media was absolutely pulverized. Thus, before Tract 90 even saw the light of day, in the mind of its author, the ship had already sailed. Today, we call on John Henry as the patron saint of converts, especially because he bore witness to the personal cost of witnessing Catholic unity. He experienced, of course, hostility from his old confrere, and for him most painfully, uh, Susie and Keeble, who used to be his, his close friend. But then he also experienced distrust and he wrote in his letters about how hard it was during that year of formation in Rome to realize that his theory of development 
Newman was received into the church by Blessed Dominic Barbary, Barbary at Littlemore on October 9th, 1845. And the next autumn, he was sent for a year of priestly formation to the Collegio de Propaganda Fidei in Rome. And it was a humbling experience for this brilliant Oxford scholar who said that sometimes it was a struggle He had been asked to deliver a sermon at the funeral of Miss Octavia Catherine Bryan, who had died tragically at the age of 18, probably from tuberculosis. She was from a prestigious Anglo-Irish family. Um, her family were from the royal line of um, the Lord Duke of, of Shrewsbury. And she was about to be married. And at the last minute, Newman was prevailed upon to deliver an extemporaneous reflection that might help bring together both Protestants and Catholics who were in attendance at her funeral. St. <laughs> <laughs> Isidore's Church um, is the National Irish Church in Rome. And um, Um, and actually today you can visit that church, St. Isidore's, and you can see um, the, near the altar, the high altar of the church, um, the sarcophagus of this young lady. Newman preached in his Anglican style. Um, he didn't have enough time to actually get the proper um, um, permission. <laughs> but he wanted us to know in his in his diary he said I, that he dressed simply in a cassock and he delivered this sermon outside of the altar rail and basically in his sermon we don't have the sermon but the reports that we have of it it was found to be a challenging sermon about how And it managed to irritate both sides of the aisle. <laughs> Newman wrote these words. The Catholics are used to the fluency of the Italians. The Catholics who are used to the fluency of the Italians did not understand my manner. And the Protestants who came for the music <laughs> or for a respect for the family and with high and mighty ideas about their own outcry from the Protestants who had expected a florid eulogy from Newman was such that one of them even opined that Newman should be thrown into the Tiber. <laughs>
of this reached the ear of Pilate the night, who is reported to have said that no one simply needed to learn that honey is more suitable than vinegar. <laughs> Ewan's letters and diaries from that year in Rome often spoke of his awkwardness and sense of being a stranger in his new ecclesial home. In his first audience with Pope Pius on 22 November 1846, Newman knelt down to kiss the Pope's foot, and instead he accidentally knocked his head against the Pope's knee. Now this see the knee of Pius. And I thought, the knee is very well to the rest. Newman's humility begins to shine in this formation here in Rome. And this is something that former Protestant clergy must learn as well. Crossing the Tiber can be an experience of not always understood or appreciated in their new home. But as Newman would reflect upon this time, he came to see that all of this is a blessing. St. Philip Neri's motto for the oratory, Amare Nescuri, to love, not to be known, so as not to be absorbed in oneself. This was the key. This left a deep impression on Newman, and it is a counsel for those who are converts, those of us who are converts, we must grow to understand, especially when the church in her desire to promote ecumenism sometimes sends the message that perhaps it might be best for a person to remain in his or her ecclesial community. Now as shocking as that sounds, there are leaders in the church that actually say that. When Pope Benedict XVI in 2009 promoted the Apostolic Constitution, Anglican or Chadywood, that allowed groups of Anglicans to bring their patrimony with them into the Catholic Church, the Times of London reported the news with the striking headline, Vatican Together with Newman, we are learning to find in this a true opportunity for spiritual growth. Some of us here were privileged to be in St. Peter's Square on 13 October 2019 when Pope Francis declared Newman to be a saint. No doubt with St. Philip Neri's motto very much in mind, the Holy Father quoted the Christian has a deep, silent, hidden peace which the world sees not. The Christian is cheerful, easy, kind, gentle, courteous, candid, unassuming, has no pretense, with so little that is unusual or striking in his bearing that he may easily be taken at first sight for an ordinary man. And Pope 
that's a certainly perhaps a, a central part of the work of Bridget Lamont. And tonight we, uh, as we just give thanks to the life of Father Bill Carr and uh, the extraordinary work that he did um, in the life of John Henry Newman, which um, I can tell you that one of my teachers, Henry Chadwick, Let us brings us with him along this journey. On his tomb is the epitaph. There's no words that you cannot give in our universe that there is not a From darkness to light and to truth. And this is a journey completed for John Henry Newman, and we certainly ask for his prayers today. And I'd like to which comes from his meditations and devotion, the prayer for Christian unity. I've never heard this used in an ecumenical service before. And it's probably very common. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, who when you were about to suffer, prayed for your disciples to the end of time that they might all be one, that you are in the Father and the Father in you. Look down in pity on the manifold And heal the many wounds which the pride of man and the craft of Satan have inflicted upon your people. Break down the walls of separation which divide one party and denomination of Christians from another. Teach all men that the sea of St. Peter, the holy church of Rome, is the foundation, center, and instrument of unity. Open their hearts 